In 2019, I was dominated by this German player, Han Ying, in three straight games. So I lost 11-6, 11-3, and 11-1. I didn't stand a chance. And in 2020, I lost again to this other German player, 1-4, and it wasn't even a close game. However, in the Tokyo Olympics, I managed to beat both of them, and Hong Kong secured the first ever team medal in history. So how did I do that? Today, I would like to share to all of you how I fought my way to the Olympics and also to accomplish one of the greatest wins in my career. When I was three years old, I used to go to my dad's training center with my sister. And as I wasn't tall enough, she would be practicing and I'd be by her side picking up balls. But I was captivated by the sound of the ping pong balls hitting the table. So it was like pick, pock, pick, pock. And once I was tall enough, I tried table tennis and immediately fell in love with it. I remembered when I was four years old, my dad asked me, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I told him that I want to be a table tennis world champion. So I started to invest my time and effort in table tennis and eventually become one of the best young players in Hong Kong. So people thought that I was naturally gifted, but what they didn't know were the sacrifices I made for table tennis. At the age of nine, I already practiced seven days a week and two hours immediately after school, and I have to finish my homework till midnight. At the age of 11, I spent my summer holidays alone in China training, while all my friends were having a great time on summer vacations with their family. So they brought me souvenirs from all over the world. They brought me small Eiffel Towers from Paris, and they got me keychains from Singapore. And all I had for them were ping pong balls. <laughs> <laughs> and at the age of 15, I made the most important decision in my life, and that is to give up my school life and pursue table tennis as a profession. To be honest, I struggled a lot at that time because as much as I love table tennis, I share the same intense passion for academics. I love to read and I read a wide variety of books. I remember really liking this Percy Jackson series by Rick Riordan and I was so empowered by those characters that I myself was inspired to become a writer. I also read a lot of science books to learn about solar systems, about the fundamentals of the universe. And I also dreamed of becoming a research scientist. However, if I made this decision of going professional in my sports, all my other dreams would die. There are actually a lot of risks becoming an athlete. We have to compete against the world, and it is very possible that we don't make it to the top we might have injuries that can shorten our career. And more importantly, if I gave up my studies at the age of 15, what can I do when I retire at the age of 30? However, quoting a line from Lady Gaga's A Million Reasons, I've got a hundred million reasons to walk away, but baby, I just need one good one to stay. <laughs> And that good reason was, I really wanted to try. Not everyone has this opportunity to become a professional in sports. And I have this passion, I have this talent, and I was very sure that I would regret in the future if I just gave up this chance just because I lacked the courage. There is a lifespan for an athlete, but learning is lifelong. So I decided to go for it, give it a shot, so that I wouldn't regret in the future. And that is how I started this journey of chasing the dream of the four-year-old who wanted to be a world champion. However, at the age of 22, I encountered a life 
changing event. So one day as I was practicing, my arms suddenly feel uncontrollable and rigid. At first I thought it was fatigue, but the problem worsened, so I had to see a neurologist. I was diagnosed with focal dystonia. So focal dystonia is a rare neurological disorder that involves involuntary spasms in small muscles, probably resulting from overuse and repetitive stress. So when I get ready to hit the ball, my arm was supposed to open up like this, but instead my arm would extend involuntarily and my wrist would bend at a weird angle. So instead of having a fluid movement forward, my arm would go sideways and I wouldn't be able to exert a force on the ball with my wrist. This greatly affected my accuracy and precision. And also, I always hit the table with my hand because I couldn't control the sudden extension of my arm. My training, hour, my, my training hours has to be cut down from eight hours to two hours. And I was really scared at that time because I still had six months till the Olympics and I couldn't even practice normal. I couldn't practice the drills that I used to do that I knew that can help me improve. And I just, I was really scared about it because I wouldn't know if I can make it to the Olympics. So I, <laughs> so um, at that time, uh, I remember one, one time in my training, I cried because I was really frustrated at myself for being unable to control my own body. I stopped training and went to see a sports therapist. The sports therapist gave me an advice at that time, which I thought was rubbish. I thought this was terrible. He said, you have to treat dystonia as your friend. You have to embrace it. And I was like, how can I embrace dystonia as my friend? This thing is destroying me. It's ruining my career. The next day, I was asked to play a friendly match with a player from a Chinese team. On that particular day, my dystonic conditions were really bad and I couldn't even hold my hand still before I serve. So from this video, you can see that my arm keeps flexing before I serve. And this was totally uncontrollable. Okay, so, um, but my opponent made a lot of random errors, so I won in the end, but I thought it was pure luck until from what my friend has told me, um, what she heard uh, about what the opponent has said behind my back. She said, Minnie's serve is so unpredictable. I never knew when and where she's gonna serve. And, <laughs> I, and I couldn't read the spin she puts on the ball. I was actually really surprised at that moment because I thought that People would only laugh at my strange movements and I've never thought that my dystonic condition can actually make my balls unpredictable. So from that incident onwards, I start to accept dystonia as a part of myself that maybe I just don't have to do the same thing as everyone else does. I don't have to practice the same drills, I don't have to practice the same long hours, and I do not have to have the same movements but instead, my unorthodox movements, movements has given me an advantage. Now that I couldn't practice as much as I would like to, I would spend more time thinking about my game. And I have analyzed for over 40 players and almost 100 matches before the Olympics on videotapes, which has given me a lot of inspirations on my tactical game. So I was these good things has happened to me because of focal dystonia. And I realized that when I started to accept focal dystonia as a part of me and embrace it as my friend, 
I was actually at, I wasn't forced to an end of my career, but only at a new starting point of my life. One of the greatest things that I have learned from the Olympics and also from Estonia is to be in the moment. Even though that I started to accept Estonia as a part of myself, that good things can also happen, it was still entirely a different thing to play in such a high-level tournament like the Olympics. So one thing about Estonia is that it aggravates when I, I experience anxiety. So when the problem surfaces, I would feel nervous about it, and when I get nervous about it, the problem worsens. And it goes on like this terrible cycle. And in order to break this cycle, I'd have to pull myself out of my worries and to be in the moment. To be honest, I didn't play well in the first few matches of the Olympics. In my first match against the Spanish player, I was so nervous that even if I get a millisecond to think before I hit the ball, I would hesitate and didn't have the confidence to make the point. I kept thinking about my past mistakes and I just didn't have the confidence to win. And I believe that this was the major reason that I lost. After this match, I was even more anxious because I felt that I didn't perform well. So I, just before the team events, my focal dystonia, this condition has gone so bad that I couldn't even make a proper serve. I couldn't even hold a teacup in my hand without these uncontrollable movements. So one day I refused to train because I just thought that I, did, I don't want my teammates to see my disability and therefore discourage them. Every day I cried silently on my bus trip to the hall because I was very disappointed in myself and also fearful about my bad performance in the upcoming matches. I mean, I still fought my best, but I just didn't have the confidence. I lost in the doubles match against Romania and against Japan, and there was totally no reason for me to believe that I stand a chance against the German players. But just the day before the bronze medal match, I suddenly realized that this would be the last match in my Olympics. Whether we win or lose, everything will come to an end. If I keep worrying about my dystonic conditions, I was so sure that I would regret in the future because this would become a barrier that I have never learned to overcome. I started to think that even if I lose Maybe I should try to enjoy the game, try to enjoy my moment in the Olympics. I suddenly remembered what my sports therapist had told me to, to embrace Estonia as my friend. And instead of worrying about my uncontrollable movements, maybe I should try to pay more attention to my surroundings, to my opponent, who might also be experiencing the same frustrations and anxieties as I do. And by focusing on my opponent, I can finally pull myself out of my worries and to appreciate the game. So in the first game against Han Ying, I was one six behind and I made lots of mistakes. But instead of criticize, criticizing myself as I always would, I just gave myself a self-affirming nod and a small fist pump, and then I moved on. Point by point, my accuracy got better and my confidence grew. I didn't think about my past mistakes, but instead focused on how to win that specific point. In that game, there were no fears, there were no doubts, there were no futures, there were no pasts, and that was a wonderful feeling of being in the moment. So we lost in the first doubles match, and uh, we lost in the, yeah, we lost in the first doubles match, and we won two singles match. So we only needed one more win to get the bronze. And it was again my turn to play in the fourth match. That was a lot of pressure for me, right? 
if I win, our team would be Olympic medalist. But did I feel the pressure? No, I didn't. In fact, I was so in control that I, it even amused me when I see my opponent getting frustrated at her own mistakes. <laughs> my friend told me that they saw me grin during my game and asked if I was celebrating a little bit too early. <laughs> but the truth is, I was in the state of euphoria and I felt so at peace. That was probably the first time in my career that I didn't think about the results, but instead enjoyed the game. And with this mentality, we won and Hong Kong made history. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and at the age of 23, I stood on the Olympic podium as my teammate hung the medal on my neck. All of a sudden, these memories came rushing back into my mind. The memory of the four-year-old who said she wanted to be a world champion. And also the memory of this 22-year-old who thought that her career was forced to end because of focal dystonia. And yet, I am here today sharing the story of this hard-earned bronze medal to all of you. Some people say that dreams are just dreams, they don't come true. And I didn't become world champion. But I am very confident to tell all of you that if you work hard enough and you have passion for what you do, you have this persistence, even though that you don't achieve your dream, you will surely accomplish something unexpected. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>